I've been thinking for months on how to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Mr. Chris Borland. And I needed some help from another star, Mr. Freddie Mercury. Please listen to the words, and I think it describes Mr. Borland's journey. I've taken my bows and my curtain calls. You, football, brought me fame and fortune and everything that goes with you, and I thank you all. But it's not been all a bed of roses, no pleasure cruise. I considered a challenge before the human race, and I ain't going to lose. Mr. Borland grew up in Kettering, Ohio, which is a city about the same size as Sheboygan. He was a four-sport athlete in high school. Yes, four sports. I love it. I wish more sport athletes were multi-sports athletes. He lettered in football, track, basketball, and tennis. Can you imagine lining up face-to-face -face against an all-state all linebacker on a tennis court? As I said, Mr. Mr. Borland was an all-state linebacker who chose the University of Wisconsin over Louisville and Iowa. Thank goodness, not Iowa, and not a Bucky for that, or Buckeye for that matter. As a Badger, he earned all-conference linebacker honors three times, including linebacker of the year in the Big Ten. He was an All-American. I, I still personally remember watching number 44 in red, and I was in awe of his quickness for his size running down those running backs. He truly was a gifted athlete. Following his senior season, Mr. Borland was drafted in the NFL by the San Francisco 49ers. His rookie year was simply amazing. He accounted for over 100 tackles. He was named to the all-rookie NFL team and he was destined to make millions of dollars and a long NFL careers. But that changed for Mr. Borland when he chose a new path in life. And here to share that tonight is our guest speaker, a true champion, Chris Borland. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, never thought in a million years I'd get Freddie Mercury as my uh, welcoming, so thank you. <laughs> um, thanks to the Elks Lodge. Uh, this is an incredible event. I've been to banquets and functions and fundraisers. This is really amazing. Uh, and I think it can be hard as young people to appreciate all of the work and support that goes into something like this. Um, but uh, you should be grateful. This is really special. Um, I also just want to take a minute to congratulate everyone in this room. Uh, competing in high school athletics on top of school, other extracurriculars, and everything that's going on in your life, uh, that deserves credit and recognition. Um, particularly, I think, uh, this day and age. It's now 15 years since I've been in your shoes, and um, I imagine it's only harder to juggle everything uh, these days. So my name's Chris Borland. Uh, was an All-American linebacker at Wisconsin. Uh, played for the 49ers for one season, and uh, as Chris mentioned, I'm known uh, often for leaving the NFL after my rookie year. Uh, the very idea that I would ever go on to play professional sports was somewhat absurd. Uh, when I entered high school, I was five feet, four inches tall, and 150 pounds. Um, so college recruiters weren't exactly drooling over a prepubescent, unathletic uh, first-year football player. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, played a lot of different sports in high school. Um, I'm known as a football player, but I only played 10 years of organized football. I started only in ninth grade. Um, so I played tennis, I played basketball, I did track and field. I'd hoped to go out for track to get faster for football, and my dad came home with shot put shoes and said, you're going to throw, which I did reluctantly, but uh, I'm glad I did it. Um, I had a wonderful sports experience. Uh, I grew up in a big family in suburban Dayton, Ohio. I'm the sixth of seven kids in my family, so my sister's the oldest, and then it's all boys. And my dad was a college athlete. He played football at Miami University in Ohio. And every one of my older siblings played a sport in college. Uh, my sister played rugby and was a world-class Irish dancer. Uh, my next brother was a cheerleader. <laughs> my next brother was a basketball player. My next two brothers were soccer players. Then there was me. 
And my younger brother quit all organized sports in seventh grade. Um, so I think it's an eclectic mix. I think it reveals some really great things about my upbringing. My parents were really good about encouraging us to follow our passions, whatever they may be. And I thought about, in, in preparation for tonight, um, I mean, the list of people that have spoken here is incredible. Bobby Knight, Pat Richter, Mark Johnson, it goes on and on and on. Uh, and thought, what can I share that will resonate with you? Uh, what can I share that is something that you can take practically when you leave out the door today? Um, and I think uh, this speech came at an interesting time in my life because this past March marked the ninth year since I quit the NFL. As I said, I only played nine years. Um, so I'm now further removed from playing than I, the amount of time I ever played. Uh, so that struck me in preparing for tonight and uh, it brought two things to mind. One, uh, it makes me feel old. <laughs> uh, but two, it was a cause for some reflection. Um, what did I do well? What was, what was I glad that I did when I was growing up or in high school or in college? Uh, what do I wish I could have back or do again? And I, I think the message really is that simple. I'm going to take you through some of my experiences. And I'm just an N of one. You know, I'm a man. I played football. I'm not from Wisconsin. I'm of a different generation. Uh, but what I hope you can do and what I invite you to do is follow along uh, and think about how my journey relates to you and your journey. So I, I won't bore you with the details of my childhood. I, I tried to think of one story that kind of encapsulates the controlled chaos I grew up in. Um, and it's something my brothers and I always used to do. We would pool what little money we had and walk to the local uh, um, hardware store. And we did this like once every month or two uh, in spring, summer, and fall. And you know we didn't have much money, but we would buy as many can cans of spray paint as we could possibly get our hands on. And to this day, I wonder what the employees thought these like elementary school aged and middle school aged kids were doing with 10 cans of spray paint. Uh, but we weren't vandalizing anything. Uh, we would go back to my parents' house, go into the backyard, and create the most amazing replica football field of Lambeau Field or Camp Randall or Notre Dame Stadium. And we played out there constantly. We put hash marks up, end zones, invited all of our friends over. We even had timed games sometimes. And I just love that story because, um, you know, we grew up in a middle class neighborhood. Not, I'm sure many neighbors weren't thrilled that there was this shoddy, uh, spray paint, spray painted field in the backyard. Uh, but my parents didn't care about that. They saw something that we loved. They saw us having a passion for something. Uh, it, that type of activity allowed us to be a part of a community. Our house was typically a hub in our neighborhood of games of all sorts. And that was the environment that I was first raised in and fell in love with, uh, with sports. Um, my first heroes weren't only Brett Favre and Michael Jordan and Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, it was watching my older siblings as they competed in high school and ultimately college. Um, <laughs> our house also sat right in between a vacant lot and our, our parish's elementary school. So I don't know that there was a day in my childhood where I got off the bus and went home first. Even if it was raining, snowing, whatever, I'd always go to St. Albert's or the lot to jump in some sort of pickup game. Uh, wiffle ball, kickball, basketball, whatever it may be. I just loved to play. I had that passion uh, for sports and for games of all sorts. Uh, inevitably, as you get older, it gets a little bit more structured. Uh, so I went from this kind of state of constant play as a little kid you know, to beginning to play at the YMCA, and ultimately join a select soccer team or an AAU basketball team. And I think there's a little bit of a, a loss of innocence when you start to play organized sports. Uh, there's something really special about that free play with friends where you're making it up and having fun and just enjoying yourselves. But there's a lot to be gained, too. And in a very real way, early on, 
Uh, organized sports broadened my horizons. Uh, my select soccer team, I, I played two years up on a team that won uh, a few state cups. And as early as sixth and seventh grade, um, you know, I was doing the ODP, uh, Olympic Development Training Program. Our club coach was also the head coach of a Division I soccer program. And I, I knew in junior high, this might be a path to college. Um, when it came to basketball, I had a powerful experience when I first started playing. I was from fourth to ninth grade, the only white player on an inner city basketball team in Dayton. And that was an experience um, that was eye-opening to a young kid and has shaped my worldview in a very real way until today. Um, Dayton, Ohio is a, um, it's a city that's fallen on hard times in a lot of ways. It's a very segregated city. Um, so I got a life lesson through that experience, uh, and I, didn't, I don't know how I ever would have gotten that lesson otherwise. Um, there was kind of a, an elephant in the room when it came to my youth sports experience. I was a good athlete. I started playing these organized sports. I was doing well. But my dad had played college football. Three of my older brothers had played high school football. All of my friends played. Our neighbor was the coach. And I didn't play. So other kids would ask why I wasn't playing. Uh, even other parents would ask. They, everybody wanted me to go out for the team. Uh, and my dad had this rule that none of his sons could play football until high school. And I think his rule predates any concerns about injury. I think it was more my dad thinking that there's better ways to develop athleticism than youth tackle football. Um, but I hated that rule. And I'd beg my dad every year, let me go out, let me go out. And he would always just say, it can wait. So finally, when I entered high school, I got a chance to do what I always wanted to do, which was play football. And it was going wonderfully in the off season. I started working out with the team in the, in the spring after my eighth grade soccer season. Uh, we started doing like seven on seven and other drills throughout that summer. And I was excelling. I was doing really well. I was getting a lot of attention from the coaching staff and from upperclassmen uh, because it was basically what I'd always done. It was backyard football. When I first put on the pads, my first practice in high school, I'd never seen a girdle before. I'd never seen like hip pads and butt pads. I'd never worn a helmet. I'd never worn shoulder pads. And my first practice was a total disaster. I didn't know how to stand as a running back. Our quarterback went to reach to hand me the ball and I just reached out and grabbed it and maybe did like six or eight juke moves, a spin move, cut back, and got like two yards. And the coach was like, what the hell are you doing? Hit the hole. I'm just playing backyard football, coach. <laughs> uh, so I knew, I knew right away I had a lot to learn. And um, I had some doubts, too, some misgivings. Um, do I just like playing backyard? Am I going to like playing organized? Am I a fool to have given up you know, a path in soccer that almost certainly could have gotten me a college scholarship? And uh, those feelings uh, waned within weeks. I think um, I got accustomed to organized football. I kind of got the hang of it and got better and better. And by the end of my freshman season, knew I had found what I wanted to do. Um, now, I was still minuscule. I was still tiny um, and had a lot of room to grow as a football player. Um, but I think I had my North Star, and, or at least the seating of a big dream. Uh, it co my participation in football coincided with our high school, uh, the best years the program had ever had. The four years I was in high school, we lost three games total. So we went undefeated my freshman and senior year. Um, I'm sorry, lost my freshman year, undefeated my senior year, and lost the state championship my sophomore year by one point. We missed two extra points in that game. And my junior year, we, uh, we lost in the regional finals. Um, and so I was just in this environment where in Southwest Ohio, in the greater Catholic League, football was a big deal. Um, I was a good player. I was just starting out. I was at a great program. Um, and there was opportunities to use football um, to get to college, 
um, to get a scholarship potentially. Uh, and I really made the conscious decision after my sophomore year, when we lost that state championship game by one point, missed two extra points, and I saw how gutted all of the seniors were, that I was gonna dedicate myself to becoming as good as I possibly could at football. Um, I still did other sports. I did track, I did one more year of basketball. Um, but really, I had this gravitational pull to football. And I think what came with that um, was another shift. So that I, I kind of went from constant play as a kid to organized sports. My freshman and sophomore year, it was organized sports, but I wasn't dedicated. I was just playing. There was a, there was a, a, a conscious decision and a shift to go from just playing on the team to being dedicated to training as an athlete. Uh, so what did that look like? Um, as a small kid with a pipe dream to play college football, um, I found on the internet the workouts that Brian Erlacher did uh, in co between college and pros. Um, basically, he, would, he was switching from safety to linebacker and needed to get much bigger. So he lifted weights for two straight hours without taking more than a six second rest between reps or a minute rest between sets. So a pretty grueling workout. Um, but I downloaded that, I adopted his program, and I did that every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday for the next two years, almost without fail. I also found the speed workouts that Donald Driver used to do. Even though I grew up in Ohio, I grew up a Packers fan because my dad's from Kenosha and uh, grand Grandpa went to UW. So I love Driver. He's one of the faster players in the NFL. And uh, I adopted his speed workout. So every Wednesday and Saturday for those two years, almost without fail, that's what I did. Um, and I think that was uh, fundamentally a good thing. But I think in reality, that comes with some sacrifices. Um, I got bigger, faster, stronger. I got better at football. I began to get some attention from college recruiters my junior year. Um, I also think in reflecting, uh, some of that singular focus came at the expense of being dynamic, of doing many other things, or doing as well as I should in school. Um, I was, I've been floored as we've been reading the, uh, the award winners. With, I don't know how you letter in 14, or get 14 letters, or have a 5.0 GPA with your busy schedule. Um, I wasn't as mature or capable as y'all as are when I was in high school. I uh, you know, did okay in school and then really began to focus on football. And I kind of thought I was crazy with how hard I was working. Um, it still was a long shot that I would get an opportunity to play in college. Um, I began to get letters, some of you may have gotten them, or just those mass letters they give everybody. And I was like over the moon. Um, but still, after my junior year, I, I had no scholarship offers. I had no stars on recruiting websites. Uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't discouraged, but I was just kind of frustrated that I hadn't gotten my shot yet. Um, and that all changed pretty quickly. So uh, in an effort to get more attention, I went to this combine for high school football players uh, and performed really well. I got um, third out of 700 attendees. And uh, the top finishers in that combine were then in, uh, invited to this uh, invite-only camp at Ohio State. Uh, and this was for big, this was for blue chip recruits. So I, I was pumped that I'd performed so well at the combine. This was a huge opportunity for me to get on recruiter's radar uh, at Ohio State. And uh, was really excited for that opportunity still had a lot of doubt in myself as to whether I really belonged. When I looked at the roster of the other players, there were guys with scholarship offers to Alabama and Notre Dame and Ohio State. Every linebacker seemed to be 6'2 or 3, 2'10 to 220. I was like 5'10 and 190 with no offers. And uh, so I, I was terribly nervous going into that, that camp at Ohio State. Didn't know how I stacked up, uh, but again, punched above my weight. I won MVP of the linebackers for that camp. Um, I'd never played linebacker. I was a running back, so uh, I think luck was on my side. Um, 
but after that, things kind of began to take off. I was ranked as a recruit for the first time. Uh, I, got, I began to get more than just the mass mail that coaches sent out. And it was thrilling to see something that was a pipe dream for uh, an undersized player, an undersized kid, to start to become real. I started to take college visits. Um, and at, at this moment, my, my dad asked me a question. And I was so desperate for any opportunity. I felt like it was almost late in the window, even though it wasn't. Um, but he asked me this question, if you had a scholarship offer from every school in the country, where would you go? And it kind of flipped on its head my thinking, because I was just desperate for one opportunity. And I hadn't thought, where do I want to go, regardless of who wants me? And I gave it some thought, and uh, it was Wisconsin. Uh, my grandpa had went to Wisconsin, dad born in Kenosha but grew up in Madison. We pulled for the Badgers growing up. I, some of my earliest memories watching college football were in the late 90s when Ron Dane was winning the Heisman. Um, I was familiar with the city. It's a great school. It's a great program. And so he said, well, why don't you go up there and take your shot? Why don't you go to camp and try to earn a scholarship? Which is kind of an absurd idea. Um, most of the time, Wisconsin knows who they want, invite them, and, and, and test them or scouts them there. I showed up to a three-day camp that I think was designed for Wisconsin residents, not for out-of-staters. And uh, it was padded. We went through all of these drills. But I showed up as an unknown. I remember introducing myself to the linebacker coach uh, at check-in, and he was literally looking over me at other recruits. <laughs> And uh, I thought, all right, I'm going to show you. Um, I probably played the best two and a half or three days of football I've ever played. It was just a divine intervention or something. Um, kicking and punting, catching passes, running routes, playing defense, pass rush drills. I just seemed to be on fire for those days. Um, I think it was really, there's this quote that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Um, I think that's what I was experiencing. I would poured a lot of effort into that moment. Uh, I would identified where I wanted to go and took a shot that was unlikely. And in, the, in those three days, I went from an unknown to, at the end of camp, a staffer tapping me and, sa and saying, hey, Coach Bielema would like to see you in his office after camp's over. I was buzzing. I was texting all my brothers and friends, like, Coach Bielema wants to see me in his office. I don't know what he wants to talk about. I don't know if he's going to recruit me. And uh, it was uh, one of the best moments of my life. If anybody's been to Camp Randall, has anybody been to Camp Randall? Most, many, some. The coach's office, offices sit atop the stadium on an entire wall of glass. And it, they literally call that room the wow room. So they bring recruits in there to show them Heisman trophies and Rose Bowl trophies and game-worn jerseys from NFL Hall of Famers. And that's, you know, Coach Bielma's office was right on the other side of that. So I walk in and my jaw is just on the floor. I, I can't believe where I am. He calls me into his office and he says, I, I like you know, the ability you've shown over the last few days. I like your versatility. Uh, we'd like to uh, offer you a scholarship. And my brother and sister were with me. I, I think I jumped over my sister on the couch to give Coach B a big hug. I nearly blacked out. I couldn't believe it. Um, a few months ago, zero stars, no attention, and in a matter of three months, uh, was offered by my dream school. So it was really um, an incredible experience. I continued to be that dedicated through high school. Uh, my senior year, our, our program won its first state championship in football. Um, I was able to be all state as a running back and, and defensive player of the year as kind of a positionless player. I just ran around out there. <laughs> but uh, it was such a charmed period. And, and that continued. Uh, I poured a lot of work into preparing to show up at Wisconsin ready for college football. And I think I was ahead of, ahead of the curve physically. Um, but I had no clue what I was doing from the X's and O's. And I was projected to play linebacker, which I'd really never played. Um, so summer went well. I had some serious doubts. I mean, I can perform, I can 
lift a lot and run kind of fast, but can I play at this level? I still didn't know, and I was starting to play a new position. And training camp my freshman year was a lot like my first practice in high school. Um, I'd literally never played linebacker, and you know I'm getting thrown in there to go against you know all American offensive linemen, and you know I don't know how to stand, uh, I don't know what to read. I spent my first meeting at Wisconsin. This might only make sense to the football players, trying to determine if A gap was on one side and then B gap was on the other, and then C. That's where I was starting from. <laughs> so remedial uh, is generous. Um, but I worked really hard. Um, I had great coaching. The upperclassmen were, were patient with me and uh, was able to start as a freshman, firstly on special teams. And then as the season progressed and there was an injury, I, I took over at weak side linebacker. Um, and it's crazy for me to think about that today, how little I knew while I was out there. I mean, I was two or three months into playing the position and I was lining up against Terrell Pryor at Ohio State in front of 100,000 people. I really don't know how I did it, um, other than fanatical effort and probably a lot of forgiveness from those around me for all the mistakes I made. Um, but that freshman year was a continuation of, of what the previous year had been. Um, we won 10 games. We beat Miami in the bowl game. Uh, I was Big Ten freshman of the, uh, player of the year and a freshman All-American. And it was just surreal. Um, in those two years, uh, I went from unknown that didn't think he'd ever have a shot to offered by Dream School, school's first state championship, and then becoming a freshman All-American. So I, I really had a hard time even believing it as it was happening. Um, I also played that freshman season with a torn labrum in my left shoulder. Uh, it was determined that I'd have to have surgery after that off season, and it was, that was a first for me. Um, I'd pretty much been healthy all throughout my life playing sports, never had any surgery of any sort, um, and that was rough on me. Um, it was a pretty serious injury. Um, I had it done during winter break, so all of Wisconsin students are home or out partying somewhere, and I'm uh, in a hotel room alone in a sling, laying up in bed in frigid weather. And uh, worked really hard to get back. I think I had a lot of promise. Um, there was talk of me be even being able to play just three seasons and then go to the NFL. Uh, so I worked really hard to rec recuperate from that shoulder surgery. I spent my time off also finally learning the X's and O's that I should have done earlier. Uh, and I was primed for a breakout year. I was on a lot of watch lists for best defensive player in the country or best linebacker. I felt healthy. I felt stronger and faster than I'd ever been. And we're playing our season opener at UNLV. And on a routine tackle in the first half, I go in with my left shoulder and just hear this huge pop. And it was out. And it had slid in and out of place all throughout my freshman year. I was usually able to put it back in and keep playing. This time, I couldn't hardly move it at all. And I tried to stick it out. I was holding on to my belt and trying to play in the game with one arm. And my coach is like, get, get this idiot out of the game. <laughs> um, they thought I'd retorn my labrum. Uh, and it was something that you could kind of recoup from with, with rehab. So I set out our, our home opener, our second, second week game did rehab, and then geared up for Arizona State, which was a really good team that year, and only lasted the first series. Uh, on the second tackle that I made, same thing, running backs bolting through, I put my left arm out. This time was even worse than UNLV. It felt like my shoulder was attached at the hip. I, I, it wouldn't move at all. Um, I kind of prided myself in my athletic career of never needing to be helped off the field. This was one of two times where I was writhing in pain and the trainers and docs came out and walked me off the field. I still remember laying on the table and having two doctors hold me down while a third cranked on my shoulder to clunk it back in place. There were people like gasping in the first row uh, of the stands. And in that moment, I thought, it's over. 
I had this singular focus and dedication to this one thing. And just like that, uh, I'll never play football again. That was kind of my thought process. Um, it didn't make sense that my shoulder was dislocating. The first surgery should have kept it in place. So it was a little bit of a, uh, some confusion from the doctors. Um, I went to see some specialists and uh, had to have a second surgery on my left shoulder. Anytime they do a second operation on the same joint, they, they do it open rather than or orthoscopically. And what, what this doctor found while he was doing my surgery that, was that the first one had worked, but I'd actually broken a bone uh, in my shoulder. So he put three screws in my shoulder, and uh, I took a medical red shirt that year. And while I was out, the trainer said, well, your right shoulder looks like your left did last year, so let's go ahead and have that operated on. So I went from those dream two years, senior and freshman year of college, uh, freshman year of college to maybe the most miserable year and a half of my life. Three major sh shoulder surgeries. Uh, those injuries kind of took me out of being a part of the team uh, for all intents and purposes. I had to switch a lot of classes to online classes. I didn't really feel like a part of the university. Um, and that was, uh, it was a tough time emotionally. I think I got a little depressed during that time. Um, I did the best I could to start again. It kind of felt like Groundhog's Day. It's like, okay, I'm gonna do another year of rehab, film study, work around my limitations to get my lower body strong. That was one approach, is I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back. Um, but when I reflect on that year, uh, as hard as it was, I, I am grateful for it. Um, it provided me a perspective. It put sports back in its proper place. I think subconsciously or unintentionally, um, I'd allowed that singular focus to completely define me. And that year and a half that I spent out, as hard as it was, uh, I, I made an intentional effort to get out of my comfort zone, to do things as simple as go to the art museum in Madison or try new restaurants, or explore out of town. Um, I began to refocus in school. Uh, and so I'm really thankful, as hard as that was, that I went through it, and I went through it when I did. Uh, I did make a full recovery. Um, wound up having a lot of success as a team my last three years in Madison. Won two Big Ten championships. I had some personal success. Um, and then the NFL was the next step. Um, a dream of mine since as long as I can remember. I was the little kid where if you ask what you want to be when you grow up, it was always pro athlete. And I was right on the doorstep of that. It's uh, the pre-draft process is something that comes really quickly. So we played our last game on January 1st or 2nd. I flew back to Madison and was training on the 3rd. In three weeks, there was the Senior Bowl, which is the all-star game for all draft-eligible seniors. A month after that was the Combine. A few weeks after that was Pro Day. Um, and I think my singular focus, my ability to dedicate myself, really helped me in that, throughout that process. Um, but I was a unique prospect. I was uh, short, slow, and injury-prone, but, <laughs> but highly productive. So kind of teams didn't know what to do with me. Some teams red flagged me for my shoulder injuries so that they wouldn't draft me. Um, there was one mock draft that had me going as the last pick in the first round. So uh, I didn't know what to expect. At that time, the draft was broadcast. The first round was on Thursday. Rounds two through four were on uh, Saturday, and five through seven were on Sunday. So my parents said, well, when do you want to have a party? When do you want to have it? I'm like, Let's have it on Saturday. If by chance I go in the first round on Thursday, we can use it as a celebration. So I'm, I'm sitting there that Thursday night of, of draft night with my parents uh, alone at their house. Uh, the Denver Broncos are on the clock. That is who Mel Kuyper had me going to with the 31st pick in the first round. And my phone rings. So excuse me, I go, holy shit. <laughs> I'm be a first rounder. This is amazing. It's a lot more money, too. <laughs> Uh, so I, I answer it, my parents' eyes get wide. Hello? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, I think I have the wrong number. <laughs> it's like, 
oh my God. <laughs> so I was a little dejected, but I was still looking forward to Saturday. And my agent had told me that I would go uh, in this range of 10 picks later in the second round, early in the third round. And um, I would have been happy to play for any team, uh, but within that 10 pick range, no offense to Joe Thomas, really didn't want to play for Cleveland. <laughs> They had been 1-31 in, in their previous two seasons. I'd never had a losing record in my life. I wasn't uh, keen on starting it in the NFL. I wanted to play for a contender. Um, so those, the 10-pick range comes up on the screen. My phone still hasn't rung. Uh, the Browns are picking in that, and they're up, and they don't pick me. And then I begin to fall in the draft. And it's embarrassing to be sitting with your family and friends and just kind of anxiously waiting to have your name called. Uh, to lighten the mood, my brother said, well, at least you don't have to go to Cleveland. And we kind of <laughs> joked and gave high fives. And then I fell so far that Cleveland was picking again. <laughs> and I thought, OK, I'm going to have to now celebrate going to a team I just celebrated not going to. Um, but my phone did ring, and it wasn't Cleveland. Uh, it was Jim Harbaugh with the 49ers. and. Uh, one of the best moments in my life, similar to that moment I had in Coach Bielema's office. Um, a culmination of a ton of work. Uh, no one does anything alone, and I had every, most people in the room that had helped me to get to that point sharing it with me, um, and it was incredible. Uh, I'm getting chills right now talking about it. I think I definitely teared up a little bit uh, when I got that call. And I fell into a perfect situation. Uh, the 49ers were the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl that year. They had statistically one of the best defenses in the NFL. And I immediately would be vying for a starting position to play alongside Patrick Willis, who's going into the Hall of Fame this year. Um, so a tremendous opportunity. Um, I was laser-focused. I think entering the NFL, my goal was to play for a decade plus. Uh, I spent a lot of time preparing, thinking about who I can model my game after. And again, short, slow, injury prone. So there's not many guys. Um, but I thought of people like Zach Thomas, London Fletcher, Sam Mills, all of these linebackers under six feet, around 245 pounds, that were smart and quicker than they were fast. And so I thought the Hall of Fame was within reach. Um, now, Brain injury wasn't something that I was totally oblivious to. Uh, I had a minute and a half loss of consciousness in eighth grade, a similar injury in 10th grade, and played through concussions in high school and college. It was also a topic that was getting a lot more news coverage while I was at Wisconsin. Um, the first case of CTE is Mike Webster, who um, played center at Wisconsin. His Hall of Fame plaque sits outside of our locker room. Um, but it was kind of a story we told ourselves in college. Well, like, he played a long time. He abused drugs. He's an outlier. Um, the first wake-up call was really before my senior year of college. Uh, Junior Seau, who was a hero of mine, uh, tragically took his life. And um, it's, it happened as I was watching a lot of film on Junior Seau because we had just switched defenses to what he had run in San Diego. Um, so it was kind of an eerie coincidence. Um, but amazingly, it, it, other than register, it didn't really change my approach. I was really, I maintained that singular focus. So I'm, I'm in San Francisco. Uh, I'm competing for a starting position. Uh, we're two weeks into camp. And on a routine play, for the football players, a B-gap lead. This just means some space opens up and a mean 300-pound person sprints at you, and you sprint at them, and whoever wins that foot wins the play. Um, Harbaugh had a penchant for turning backup defensive linemen into fullbacks, <laughs> which meant our fullback was like 6'4", 320. Uh, and we called him Big Will. And I remember that play. I, I, the hole opens up in the B-gap. And again, I'm, excuse me, oh, oh shit, that's Big Will. And I charge at him and do what I've done a million times at Wisconsin, like a huge hit, stun him. And that's the last thing I remember. 
Um, I was nauseous. I was dizzy. My ears were ringing. I knew what it was. It wasn't a foreign thing. It, it happened to varying degrees over the last eight years, but I was concussed. And I didn't report it. I think in my mind at that time, uh, I couldn't afford to miss a week or two or more and still win that starting position. Um, so that's a complex thing. I, 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 um, I, it's easy to say I should have, um, and I think that would have been the responsible thing to do. Uh, but there's a lot of money at play, there's a lot of dreams at play, and it's just not what I did. Uh, I wound up not winning the starting position, so I started out on special teams. Um, and just like my freshman year, our starter went down and I filled in for him halfway through that year. And wound up playing great. I um, you know, led the team in tackles and, and uh, was named to the Pro Bowl as an alternate, as a rookie. I got exactly one vote for Rookie Defensive Player of the Year, which is which is exciting. But uh, I also spent that year look, learning everything I could about the health outcomes of NFL players. Um, it had been in the news so much. I had a bad injury history myself. Um, I wanted to get a clearer picture of what I was getting into if I were to play for 10 plus years. And what started as an innocent Google search in August uh, grew to, by January, I was meeting with world-leading experts for clinical evaluations, having imaging done, um, and talking to people that have been working on this for decades. Um, and what became clear to me is that you know, my goals in football um, diverged from my goals in life. I didn't see how I could continue to do what I had to do with Big Will week in and week out for 10 weeks uh, with my injury history, with my position, with my playing style. Um, so I decided to walk away after one year. And uh, people ask if, if uh, or assume that must have been a really hard decision. Um, and it was. Uh, I think the harder part were, was the year or two after. I think at 24, I was naive to how white hot contentious the conversation was around brain injury and football and how the science is funded and you know, what's the obligation of institutions. And reluctantly and unwittingly, uh, I became kind of a flag bearer for a cause. Not something I had intended to do. I just wanted to make a decision that was in my best interest. And a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of media outlets were kind of saying, I'm anti-football. Um, so it was a crazy, you know, the, the six months uh, after retiring, March 13th, 2015, uh, was a whirlwind. I was on Face the Nation. Uh, it's usually a show reserved for like world leaders. <laughs> I was on CBS this morning. ESPN followed me around for four months to do a tell-all article. And I was, uh, oh man, I was sick of it. I didn't want to be the concussion guy. Um, I kind of wanted to be left alone. It became clear that that wasn't going to be an option. And amidst all the contentiousness, all the conversation around brain injury and football, I didn't want the one thing to be lost about the guys that built the NFL. Uh, because wherever I think your opin opinion falls on the cost-benefit analysis of playing, the men that played in pro football in the 50s, 60s, and 70s really built the league and didn't make any money. These guys had off-season jobs. Um, and they're responsible for this behemoth that we have today. And what I learned in my rookie year and in the year that I quit was that these men, you know, don't qualify for benefits, um, are in need of things as simple as, you know, someone to help cover the cost of surgery or the cost of, of mental care. And there were you know, 5,000 plus of these stories. Um, so I wanted to turn what was my own stress and what was a difficult topic into something positive and try to be really intentional about that uh, and did it in two ways. I, I got a chance to meet Mike Ditka and work with Coach Ditka uh, on his assistance fund. So he created an organization with Jerry Kramer, who's a Hall of Fame former Packer, called Gridiron Greats. And the idea behind that was no BS, no waffling, these guys deserve to be taken care of. And Coach Dick has done wonderful work. I, I was thrilled to be a part of that for 
a few years. Another way in which I wanted to turn this difficult situation uh, into something positive was finding specific services that help athletes. Um, usually they're costly. Sometimes there's a lot of hoops to jump through. And um, that was a frustration of mine. Of what, what programming can we do that can help an athlete who's suffering? And amidst all of this turmoil, uh, this, the kind of the irony for me uh, is that I was doing all of this work to take care of other people's mental health, and it was really draining on my mental health. Uh, I was burning out. I was frustrated to the point of becoming cynical. And you know, another divine intervention, uh, at this time I was introduced to Dr. Richie Davidson. Um, and Richie is, is a world famous neuroscientist. He's at UW Madison. And he is famous for putting Tibetan Buddhist monks in F fMRI machines 25 years ago. And for the first time in human history, we're actually seeing structural changes in the brain. So these, these are kind of like the Olympic weightlifters of meditation. And we're actually, Richie had proof. So just an amazing person, someone I didn't know of while I was in school, even though his lab was right next to our grass practice field. Um, but I met with Richie, um, read his work, began to meditate, saw that it helped me with all the stress I was going through. And that was a light bulb moment for me. I thought, I'm looking for an intervention that's not costly, that has minimal side effects, and I'm looking for it for this population of former NFL players. That became meditation. So I teamed up with Richie, worked for two years on developing a first-of-its-kind pilot program with 17 former NFL players uh, in meditation. Um, maybe it's very common now. It felt like in 2015, like I was... Uh, foolish for doing this, but I think with the growth of Headspace and Calm and others, um, it's pretty common now. Um, but that program was a resounding success. Uh, all the players that went through it loved it. Uh, and then I got to meet with Chris McIntosh, who's Wisconsin's athletic director, show him the results from our pilot program, uh, establish kind of a case use for this work's place in college sports. And to Chris's credit, he got the vision. And the teacher that ran our pilot program, Wisconsin's athletic director, wound up hiring as the nation's first director of meditation training in big time college sports. Um, that's the full circle moment for me with Wisconsin sports. Uh, when I think about that sophomore year that I had, I really wish I would have had um, an instructor like Chad, who's the director of meditation. I get to work some with Wisconsin athletes now, and they all rave about it. Uh, what's neat about what Chad's work is that he's also working in research. So everything he does with athletes is published. And those research articles are first stomach, starting to come out, and the results are mind-blowing. So it's really, for me, that was a beautiful closure, I think, to my experience as an athlete. Uh, grew up loving it went from free, unorganized, constant play to a little bit more structure, to probably taking it too seriously, to maybe having some identity challenges after uh, being dedicated to one thing and then leaving it, a chance to come back, to grow, to learn, uh, and to improve a place that you love um, means the world. So I I'm thankful to everyone that's helped me on that journey. Uh, Wisconsin has a special place in my heart, and I think that's the message I, I would leave to you. Um, take inventory of how many people have helped you get where you are and will help you get where you're going, uh, and remember to thank them with your actions, with what you do, with how you show up in the world, with how you give back. Uh, I think too often in sports we measure success by accolades or wins and records. Um, I think a positive sports experience is that you're healthy and active and a part of a community the rest of your life. So thank you, good luck, and God bless.